Previously on AI Adventures, we looked at how to use feature activations for understanding neural networks. How can we extend these ideas further and get even more out of these methods? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome to AI Adventures, where we explore the art, science, and tools of machine learning. My name is Yufang Guo, and on this episode, we're going to extend the ideas of feature activations in convolutional neural networks even further by applying them to entire images to create activation grids, and then see how we can use that to produce an activation atlas. This video picks up where the previous video left off, so if you haven't watched that, you should definitely check it out first. Now, previously, we looked at how the neurons in a convolutional neural network's layers can be organized into channels and then stacked like a layer cake. We can also organize it in our mind vertically so that we are looking at a certain patch of that layer and consider the activation of all neurons stacked together over a region. We call this spatial activations. Spatial activations give us a sense of what features a specific region of an image is activating most strongly. By doing this across all the different patches of an image, we can build an activation grid, showing us the features that are activating the strongest for each region. This is for only one particular layer, so now we want to repeat this process for the other layers, some earlier in the network and some later earlier layers like Mix3A. They show us the edges and patterns that still mildly resemble the original image, while later layers are much more identifiable as the animal body parts that are being recognized in that part of the image. Now activations are, they're just numbers, right? And so some activations, they can be larger than others. So what we can now do is scale the size of each of these grids to the size of the activation. So that'll give us a sense of the importance of a given region of the image to that layer, based on how strongly the network is activating. So now we can see which regions are most strongly activated per layer and how these activations are propagating through each layer of the network. Now this gives us a sense of the saliency of the different parts of the image. Activation grids tell us about some of the activations of the neural network for a specific image. But what about all the other activations of the network? How might we understand the other types of activations? Well, we'd need to feed in lots of example images of all sorts of types. So what if we did that? We could run lots of images. In fact, we could run a million different example images through the network and record all of their activation grids. All these individual activations correspond to some kind of higher dimensional location in the neural network's activation space, so to speak. And if we position uh, our activations, each of these subgrids, into their respective locations in this higher dimensional space, we now have, for our one million example images, broken up and scattered across this landscape. Unfortunately, high dimensional spaces are, well, they're tough for us to visualize, so we can project this space down to two dimensions. But there's still the problem of having just millions of activations to deal with, right? So that's rather unwieldy for visualizing. So let's draw a grid over the whole 2D projection, and we'll take for each grid the average of the activations within it. This won't cause us to lose too much detail since activations that are close together, they're, they're similar to one another. So now we can finally resize each grid based on the number of activations on that grid, giving us a sense of how strongly the network responds to that particular type of input. Now we can repeat this entire process for a couple different layers, put it into a nice web interface, and you have an activation atlas. So Let's explore it and see what it looks like to navigate through this space. If we start our journey in the top area of the layer mixed 4C, there appears to be kind of a variety of dog faces. Then as we go down, things shift to showing kind of the backs of four-legged animals, and then we keep going, we get to some legs and feet, 
merging into the ground and ground related things and that slowly transitions into kind of sandy surfaces and some water. There's lots of interesting paths through the Activation Atlas and it's really neat, I think, that the images shown, you know, they smoothly transition from one region to the next. We can also look at a uh, specific class activations in the atlas. So we can filter it out and just look at one particular class. Let's say the great white shark. I like to start with the bottom most layer, mixed 5B, since that's going to show images that are most similar to kind of the final prediction. So we can really recognize what it is we're seeing. It's meaningful. We see some regions we'd expect, you know, various fish-like imagery. And over here, there's some uh, water-related imagery, right? And uh, what's, what's this over here? Yeah, that, is that a baseball? What is a baseball doing so late in the network structure? So if the network thinks that baseballs have a pretty strong relationship to, well, great white sharks, what would happen then? Perhaps if we added an image of a baseball, just slapped it on top of this image of a gray whale, could we fool our neural network into thinking that it's seeing a great white shark? At first, it doesn't quite work. But with a bit of fiddling around with the image size, we can get the network to output Great White Shark as its top prediction for the image. This is pretty fun, and you can look for all sorts of other oddities. I also found in the Mix 5B layer for Great White Shark that Airship is another kind of unusual label associated with Great White Sharks. So I tried to do something similar. I went online and found some images of airships and tinkered around with the sizing and position of the airship image. And I found that I could eventually convince the model that it was a great white, or in some cases, a killer whale, depending on the airship I use and where I put it. So you should try this out. And be sure to share what kinds of funny predictions you got the model to make in the comments down below. Neural networks are generally opaque. But with tools like an activation atlas at your disposal, you can get a better understanding of how they work and expose some of the weaknesses that might be present. I'm excited about the possibility of how these approaches will be extended in the future, as well as its applications to other types of models as well. Thanks for watching this episode of Cloud AI Adventures. And if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to get all the latest episodes right when they come out. For now, check out activation analysis and see if you can find something interesting in the relationships between the different data classes.